Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to Coffee and Something Stronger. My name is Cody Norad. I am the Director of Programs and Policy at Georgia Interfaith Power and Light. And Coffee and Something Stronger is a coffee style interview show where I sit down with academics, practitioners, and faith leaders from across the state and across the nation to talk about the intersections of faith, environmental justice, climate, COVID-19, and also the Black Lives Matter movement. And this morning, I am incredibly excited to sit down with a colleague and friend in this work in so many ways, um, Reverend Brendolyn Jenkins Bozeman, who is the a pastor at Hudson Memorial CME and also the executive director of the Imani Group. Um, the congregation is in Augusta and the Imani Group is in South Carolina. And so she is doing work across state lines and in so many different fields. And so uh, thank you so much for being here this morning, Reverend. And I wanted to give you the opportunity to introduce yourself and briefly tell us how you got into this work. Good morning, Cody. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And uh, how I got into this work was by virtue of being born to a woman by the name of Johnny Ruth Jenkins. So the work is not what I do, the work is actually who I am. Um, I celebrated a birthday last week and I shared that uh, a photo of me in my revolutionary days, Afro and all at 16 years old. And my comment was by that time, I was a seasoned revolutionary who had been marching since I was eight years old. So that's how I come to this work. Yeah, well, thank you. Well, uh, I think that you have, I wanna dig into your past a bit, but before that, I think you have a reading mm -hmm. to offer. So I'll, I'll hand it to you to allow you to lead us in that. Yes, I'm reading a very interesting book that was a part of a presentation that I had to prepare for the African American Ministers Leadership Council a program of People for the American Way. Our national director, Reverend Leslie Watson Wilson, passed this assignment off to me. And it's Christ and Crisis, Why We Need to Reclaim Jesus. And it is a book by Jim Wallace. Jim Wallace is a noted writer and a teacher and justice advocate. And so, um, I will read from the truth question. Sound familiar? While reform thyself should be the starting point for any calls to public reform, it is often passed over completely. How can we ever act upon the truth to change our public life when we deny or ignore the same truth in ourselves and don't even see it? Humility is always a prerequisite for truth telling. Otherwise, we can easily become blind to the meaning of the truth we claim to be for. My friend Richard Rohr describes the plank in your eye as embracing the shadow. As he shows how much of our lives are lived in the shadows, indeed the shadows become the working and even living places for too many of our political leaders, but also for some church leaders. And of course in our own lives because it is harder to see or recognize the truth in the shadows. Jesus' phrase for the denied shadow is the log in your own eye, which you instead notice as a splinter in your brother's eye. Jesus preceded modern psychology's shadow work by 2,000 years. His advice is absolutely perfect. Take the log out of your own eye, and then you will clearly see to take the plank out of your brother's eye. Jesus does not deny that we need to deal with evil, but we'd better do our own housekeeping first. If you do not recognize your own log, it is inevitable that you will project hate and hate it elsewhere. In political campaigns, hateful candidates invariably accuse others of being hateful and angrily attack others for being angry. People with little self-knowledge usually do not see this clear pattern, but instead join with them in their chat. When you note the splinter in your brother's eye, this is from uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's Splinters and Planks. When you note the, sp the splinter in your brother's eye and fail to see the plank in your own, this figure of speech used by Jesus might seem for a moment quite exaggerated. But if we stop for a moment and analyze human actions with the disinterested eye, we will find that this contrast is not big enough, but it is common human trait to see the weakness of others and never see one's own weakness. The splinter and splanks 
plank scandal has presented itself throughout human history. In colonial Virginia, a man could be sent to jail for failing to attend church twice on Sundays, while at the same time, the slave trade went on with the sanction of the church and religions. I will end there. Thank you so much. Will you say a little bit about why you picked that reading and why that's important to you? One of the things, that, the, the reason I picked that reading and, and, and Jim Wallace talks about the uh, seven or eight truths that we must confront it, is that in this time of, 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 of the, the, the peeling away of the scab of the wounds of our society, we must face our own truths. We must come to the truth um, um, before any reconciliation. We must come to the truth um, um, of our actions or the actions of our society or the inactions, you know, covert uh, or overt sins or inactions. And, and really began to, to debride those wounds and then before any bombs, any Gileads, any, any comfort can be put to them. And so to uh, deny the truth is to live in a, uh, uh, and as he talked about the psychology of a schizophrenic uh, existence, and I'm not talking about in terms of mental illness, just in terms of being able to, to authentically and honestly live and exist and serve especially yeah i want to follow up on a couple of those things before i do because once we dive in we'll never come back um i wanted to ask you about your tradition in cme and if you'd tell our viewers a bit about that denomination and, and how you operate in that and then also you know does that are there something I like to ask everybody is how their tradition has influenced the way that they think about environmental justice or have become involved in different justice initiatives. And so how does that tradition support you and give you the tools to do that? Well, as so many, my, 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 my journey to the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church was a curious at best. I was born and raised in the Baptist tradition and, and ordained as a Baptist uh, minister and then served in, in an interdenominational congregation in Camden, South Carolina. And through, um, as I mentioned earlier, the African American Ministers Leadership Council, we have an initiative called Vessels Vote that trains clergy and faith leaders um, uh, in the ministry of social justice through civic engagement. And so we were doing a series of trainings around the country and we were doing trainings for the, with and through the CME church. And the then uh, Bishop of the Sixth Episcopal District, which is Georgia, um, um, Bishop Kenneth Wayne Carter, um, uh, uh, probed me and prompted me uh, for a couple of years to come and be a part of the CME tradition. And uh, uh, I shared that, that that I'd not gotten a word from on high that that was the move I needed to make. And and as folks say, he slow walked me and uh, uh, invited me to to come into the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. And five years ago this month, five years ago, actually this past Sunday, uh, I became the pastor of Hudson Memorial CME in Augusta. This and what what prompted me is the the uh, uh, training, the the uh, call for uh, uh, social justice, the salt call for balancing uh, the word and the work with feet on the ground and outside of the walls. And that, that, that really uh, piqued my interest and spoke to who I was. And then it allowed me, though I live in Aiken and I pastor in Augusta, is just a 20 minute drive across the river. And it gave me an opportunity to launch into a wonderful, wonderful, rich harvest field in the community of East Augusta and to uh, link hands and heart at the shepherd with some wonderful people, very few in number. Um, our congregation is very, very small, but we're, and I, as, as my former pastor, uh, uh, Pastor Doug Slaughter at Second Baptist said, we're not a mega church, but we do mega ministry. And so to have the freedom um, um, to express that, um, uh, uh, linked with the long tradition of, of advocacy and justice work that the CME Church has done since its birth in 1870. That's great. Can you say, I really like the way that you phrased balancing the word and the work, right? Feet <laughs> on the ground doing that. And I, I wondered, you know, what are some of the places in the word or your text that you go to, to 
foster that ground that work and kind of propels you and allows you to push your congregation forward in trying to do that. So I, I, I sent you um, uh, um, my bio and uh, um, I tell people I'm a bad sister on paper. There's some <laughs> things between the lines that are not there. Um, uh, and where I go, I tell people, you can write my introduction, but this is my introduction. And Jesus stood and he opened the scroll and said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the good word, the um, uh, release of captives, um, uh, uh, visitation of the sick, visiting those that are in prison, um, uh, sight to the blind. That's my mandate. And so um, um, whether it's Old Testament mandate from Isaiah that Jesus chose and being a part of this Jesus movement, that's my mandate for ministry. That's my model. That's my um, mantra in, in what I feel that I'm called to do as a gatekeeper and as a servant leader. Yeah, the work with the hands seems to be bound up with the professions that you, yes, that you make. Yes, yes, it's it's yes. hard to, to tease those out. You've been working in Augusta for a while. You talked a little bit about that. And I know um, for, those, for those watching, um, we've been working together through a connection between Gipple and your congregation for some time now. And so I wondered if you'd talk a little bit about first, maybe, um, well, how has the work been trying to instill environmental tenants with your congregation? What are the successes and the challenges of that? Well, one of the things I, <clears throat> I'm convinced that the, um, the shepherd of the flock imprints the flock. Um, so, so those causes, those, those, those things close to the heart, I believe that, that pastors have some, uh, uh, um, uh, metamorph they they that you know my icon is a butterfly they they metamorphosize into the congregation and hopefully for action and so having been an environmental justice criminal justice social justice advocate it was just the right thing to begin to um, educate and empower our congregation on 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 uh, the 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 stewardship of, of, of this earth, of this terra firma. Um, um, the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, but we are stewards of this. And when we look around at, especially in the, our community of East Augusta, circled and ringed by major industry, petrochemical, major chemical plants, high incidence of violence and asthma and all kind of chronic dis-ease, um, um, uh, to be able to infuse that into the language of my sermons, especially working with my young people, deuces to my young people that are watching, um, um, to begin to educate and empower them. It was seamless. It, it was not hard. It was not laborious. It was um, uh, uh, a process over this past five years of making and, 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 and allowing our congregation to be aware of what we need to do. We went through a major renovation last year at this time, we were in major renovation. And that's um, also a part of the time that our congregation was introduced, you know, although you and I worked together with what introduced the Gipple through our energy audit. And when you're talking about limited resources as in dollars and cents, it, um, it was easy to convince our congregation to look at ways to keep our funds and resources to do ministry and not pay George, Georgia power. And so, yeah. so it was seamless. So looking at, at our lighting and looking at insulation and looking at uh, HVAC systems, it was easy when you couple that with, with, with the tangible um, uh, dollars and cents savings as well as our stewardship. Yeah. Could you talk a bit about, you, you mentioned it a little bit, the particular struggles, environmental or otherwise, for East Augusta, and then also maybe where, where you're working in Aiken, um, because you, you actually have a good understanding, I feel like, with your work with um, both the Southern Climate Energy Network, as well as your work with the Amani Group, and now pastoring there, you're in between two states. You know, what do you see as some of the major issues for those communities? Well, listen, since 2004, 
the Imani Group has been in existence and our work primarily in the work of environmental justice has been around uh, the nuclear industry. We live in Aiken, South Carolina, which is the crown, the home of the crown jewel of the world's nuclear arsenal. Um, uh, an incident, accident, and Aiken, South Carolina would make uh, Fukushima or Chernobyl look like child's play. And so um, uh, my mother brought me and my awareness to the environmental justice work and I became a member of the Citizens Advisory Board at the, at the Department of Energy Savannah Riverside. So for years we've served as community partners with the DOE and EPA, and that causes some tension with my environmental justice colleagues and friends. But I am convinced, Cody, that it's better to be at the table because if you are not at the table, trust, you will be on the menu. And so being at the table, being at these tables to be able to listen to policy, missions, and programming has been very vital for us. Um, uh, the, the work in East Augusta, and the work in Aiken, South Carolina, the work in Atlanta, any communities of color or low wealth, um, communities that are vulnerable to, to industrial sightings and, 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 and so forth, someone has to um, uh, hopefully be that advocate and be that gatekeeper and be that person on the wall looking out. As a person who also tries to be at these tables and the legislature at the Pu uh, Public Service Commission trying to dialogue and compromise and figure out some of these solutions when we're when we're pushing you know on these justice issues what do you how do you balance the need to be at the table the need to be in conversation and then also this uh, mandate to be prophetic so so at the tables and in the field and on the battlefield is not the place to hear, it's the place to act. And you have to find that place to hear uh, the direction, to hear the shift, to hear the move. And so Sunday, I, 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 I'm, I'm becoming a social media um, uh, 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 <laughs> maven. I, I took my, my um, avocado toast and, and, and my coffee to my garden and I quoted that hymn that said, I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. And he walks with me and he talks with me. You have to find your garden to hear. You've got to hear, be able to hear the still small voice. You've got to be able to hear the rustle of the tree. You've got to be able to feel the breeze and understand that spirit speaks. And so I find that I have to force myself to those places of solitude often. And how do I do that? And I brought a show and tell for you is I'm a, a garden. These are tomatoes hey. from my garden. So I plant, I, I get to be godlike. I plant a seed and I water it and I nurture it and God gives the increase and I can produce. And matter of fact, I can be a Joseph and feed somebody when the famine comes. And so, so it allows me and I tell my friends, so I go pull weeds out of my garden so when I walk outside I'm not pulling wigs and weaves and doing damage and harm. <laughs> so I go to a zen-like place and I can hear. Mm. I can hear the birds. I can I can feel the bit. So 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 I have to to make time for that. It is it is intentional and not accidental. It has to be intentional um, and not accidental. And um, uh, um, the the one of the beauties of, of, of this time of quarantine and isolation is that um, I've, I've spent more time with my husband, my dear Bobby, um, uh, than any time in, in, in our life. And we've concluded that we really do like each other. And so <laughs> we've spent time um, um, really for the first six weeks, every day, except Sunday, working to transform our yard and, and to create a place of sanctuary. 
And so that's, that's kind of some of what I do. And then I, I delight in pushing buttons. I get joy of, of, of challenging and teaching and, and the ask awareness and skills and knowledge, pushing that information to my community. You know, that's good because it, um, you know, it's common in chaplain circles to talk about you can't really do chaplaincy effective unless you know what you're bringing into the room yourself. And you, hearing you say that, it's almost the same if you're going to try to do policy work or, you know, kind of straddle the line between serving faith communities and speaking about justice and then trying to sit at a table or be in conversations with people who you, you might not agree. But to be effective, you have to know what you're bringing, what you're you know, what your anger is, what your strengths are, what your passions are. It's interesting. Well, I want to talk more about the Imani group because it serves all these intersections. I think um, the way the Imani group's mission is to work kind of at the intersections of sexism, classism, ageism, and racism. And I wondered, um, could you talk about how you see the issues of sex, class, age, and race playing out in environmental concerns? Oh, absolutely. So, so that acronym really, um, it, the, the scars, the scars of, of the global society, that's our, that's one of our missions to eliminate those scars, the scars of sexism, classism, ageism, and racism. And God knows we see that played out just so powerfully um, uh, in a negative sense right now. Um, uh, the Bonnie Group, our programmatic areas are criminal justice, environmental justice, youth leadership development and organizational management. And in those, those programmatic areas, our board members that chair each one of those committees are, are, um, are actually some world-renowned um, um, board members that we have working with criminal justice, environmental justice, youth leadership. And so they're not, they, they, they're, they, often it's a waffle, but our work is like the spaghetti, it's all mixed up together. We work in compartmentalized waffle cups, but at the end of the day, it all interfaces and intersects. And so when we work on environmental justice, we may do job training, which we've done. You know, our dear friend, Reverend Leo Woodbury and, and Sister Loretta Slater up in, up in Florence, South Carolina, we're partners in, in the South Carolina Environmental Justice Network. Well, we went, may train uh, some community residents in solar panel installation that are formerly incarcerated returning citizens, the intersectionality of our work. Mm. We did a second chance job training program with a, uh, an organization to, to give not only to returning citizens, but unemployed, underemployed men and women in our community. We housed that at Hudson. Um, uh, uh, Hudson was, was our space that, that created resource income for the congregation and, 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 and also allowed us to sit in the middle of our community and train three classes of men and women in construction trades. Um, on the intersectionality of our work, purposely looking for unemployed um, um, youth, um, uh, 18 to 24, 16 to 24, to come and, and um, be a part of this, the intersectionality of our work. We have um, youth leadership programs, the Sharp Sisters, um, means Sisters Honoring African Rites of Passage. This is a 25 plus year program initiative for young women in leadership in our community. And complementary to that, we have the Bold Brothers, brothers offering leadership diversity. They gave me these masks for my birthday last, last week um, um, with their logos on them. Um, uh, so, so that's the intersectionality of our work. It's not separate, it is all together. And so, uh, I think that I, I think that I'm answering you. I hope. Uh, yeah, that's good. No, that's good. And I'm gonna I'm gonna move us deeper into that question. You know, here, um, one of the most things that uh, one of the things that intersects the most, I think, about as I observe and try to participate uh, with conversations around police brutality and defunding police is also a conversation about prisons and about reentry programs. And because you do and have done and in various ways been involved in those structures. I wonder if you could talk about whether you see a link between criminal justice reform and environmental justice circles and what those intersections might be. Well, absolutely. So, so let me just say that 
criminal activity happens in all communities. Violence happens in all communities. Disproportionately and disparately, it happens in, in low wealth um, and communities of color. Low wealth and communities of color. And so, so I, I'm convinced that when you, 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 you our job training, uh, uh, we, we love acronyms, is EMERGE empower, manage, educate, relationship, goals, and employment. And when you can have communities that, that, that uh, I'm not talking about feel good about how I feel happy or not. I'm talking about communities that are building wealth, communities that are building home ownership, communities that are building employment, communities where there are healthy foods, communities where there are healthy schools. Then the, 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 and when the intervention of police and public safety is different, when we address the mental health um, uh, um, um, situations, the mental health conditions of not just the adults, but the children, the, the PTSD of children living in communities of violence. And what that does, communities where there is, I say children only eat beige food, chicken nuggets, french fries, pizza, spaghettios, and, 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 and uh, uh, hot pockets, and, and not recognizing the chemical imbalance of what a child comes to a school with. And I've been in hell all night long from the violence in my communities or what's happening. And you tell me to sit down in a seat and listen to you talk at me. It, so we've got to comprehensively look at that. And so when we talk about, when you hear the word defund the police, no, I need, I need when I dial 911 and someone is, is violating my person, someone is breaking into my home and criminal activity, I need the popo to show up. But I don't need you to show up because somebody's drunk sitting in a car. I don't need you to show up because a kid in a classroom won't sit down. I don't need you to show up because a homeless person is causing a disturbance. We need other services in our community. And I proposed in Aiken years ago, we need a council of elders. We need that when there is uh, uh, non-violent low-level crime in our communities that before we send you to jail, that you sit before your elders and you have these conversations. See, we got to step the plank in our own eye. And, and, and I know people will talk about the violence in Chicago, but there was a program I introduced this years ago to our, the, the interrupters. There's no shooting that happens in the street that somebody don't know about. Somebody knows it's projected because we, we talk. And so I'm not talking about snitching. I'm talking about a concerted group of people who interrupt the violence and will put yourself on those front lines, whether it's faith leaders. We have a group of young brothers here in Aiken, uh, uh, Chris Emanuel doing, uh, doing programs around fatherhood and, and, and no deadbeat dads. They're not deadbeat. They're often dead broke. Those incorporating those into public safety spaces and places and resourcing them to be viable partners in this work of keeping us safe yeah, and doing justice good. at the same time. The interrupters is a, is a really good thing to pull out, especially kind of how these, there are creative ways to do grassroots peace building with people who live there. So you know, how do you do that? And I think you, you revisited your quote and I was about to ask you again, you know, how do you foster these environments of humility and truth telling at the grassroots level? As you leave egos at doors, you come as co-creators to a process. I don't come as an elder into the room having all the answers but I do come with uh, intellectual property that's valuable, that with our 21st century advocates and young people and great minds and their creative genius and what they can do at the touch of a button, while I'm still trying to put a dog on stamp on a letter and mail out some flyers, when we couple that and, and, and not demand that they kiss rings, and wring out batons out of almost rigor mortis set hands. 
when we can come in a co-creative protest coding, I mean, a process, then transformation is possible. And it can be instant. Some things take time. Some things are not microwavable or drive through. But there are some things that's instant with just attitude adjustments and coming as co-equal and co-creative partners to the process of justice and equity and liberty and freedom and the pursuit of happiness, whatever your happiness is, to fight for your right to pursue that. That's good. I um, We've got just a couple of questions left uh, this morning as I try my best to keep us on time. <laughs> um, but I want to talk about, you know, we've had some robust conversations about what's the church's role in direct action and how, you know, minister, a minister's role intersects with the things going on with Black Lives Matter movements, movements around police brutality, and also um, some conversations about why the courts matter. And so I want to toss that all in your lap, knowing that you will do fine with it. So, so, so what, what can the church do in terms of direct action? Direct action is not always hitting the streets in a march. Uh, direct action for Hudson, and again, kudos to Hudson, and, 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 and again, um, uh, not a mega church, not mega people. Uh, if we've got 50 people on Sunday, I promise you we are crowded. But what we've done is job training. What we've done is taken our young people to the climate reality train, project training with former Vice President Al Gore. What we've done is, 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 is partnered with the Bomb and Gilead to bring um, Southeast Diabetes Faith Initiative to us. And what we've done is partner with um, the Georgia Interfaith Power and Light. What we've done is partner with Second Chance. What we've done is created a after school program partnering with Mount Zion uh, Community Development to, to after school 25 children. What we've done with a handful of people is mega ministry. And so direct action is you do, what do you have in your hand, Moses? I have a rod. Use what you have in your hand you you we don't we do a lot but we're not doing it all and we shouldn't have to do it all if we do our little bit and the next one because we're the most populated um business entity in the black community is the church we're all over and everywhere so if you do what you can do in direct action in the midst of COVID is that is that we we started a food bank where we could we only have capacity to serve 25 families, but that's 25 families that's not hungry. And in the spirit of co in the time of COVID, we've now partnered with the Golden Harvest Food Bank. We pick the food up, the boxes, and we deliver them. That's what we can do. That is what we do. We talk, don't just talk about it. We, our talkology is, is not our walkology, folks. We can talk about it or we can be about it. My mentor in the, in the, in the, in the reentry program, uh, the late Ed Menifee said, uh, 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 um, uh, it's good to know, but you're paid to show. What are you showing? Yeah. And so I challenge that to faith leaders. In terms of the Black Lives Movement, if, if there is a faith leader anywhere and particularly a black faith leader who is not um, um, marrying word and work and understanding that that holy writ is the story of oppression and the people's fight against empire and the people and, and Jesus is challenged to empire um, and if we don't see that and be able to articulate that and preach that and encourage that yeah, I don't know I don't know, then we've got some blood on our hands for not doing that. And when you say courts matter, I looked yesterday, Cody, at the landmark um, decision by the Supreme Court that says that, yeah, we had the, 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 our, our LGBT brothers and sisters had the right to go to the courthouse and get a marriage license in their pursuit of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They never have to come to the church to get married. They don't need the pastor to sanction their marriage or a denomination. And I, I understand that in some of our disciplines, we have those, those, those tenants, but you can pursue your happiness. And far be it from me as a pastor, as a faith leader, as a black 
person, as a woman, to want to put my foot on your neck and discriminate against you because of who you love. And, and so though you could go do that, I could still fire you from your job because of the life you chose to live. And so, so we cannot want freedom. And, and I know this is so controversial because we'll pull out them one or two scriptures in which we want to oppress somebody else. And, and, and so, so, so I, 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 I also have to fight for your freedom and your liberation and your rights for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So there's great conversations that have to be, but courts matter. The evangelical right could overlook the reprobateness of the occupant of the public housing project at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue because courts mattered to them. While we are, the streets are burning, the Senate is affirming judges that will sit for life. Courts matter. And so that is something that we've got to be aware of. And that has to be a part of our political advocacy, a part of our voting, a part of our education to our congregation. And it is just way beyond who we call the president. Those things matter. Yeah, no, that's all really good. Okay. Well, this is what I, I really want to ask you about, and I'm not gonna, I'm gonna let you share what you wanna share, but I wanna ask you about resilience. As a person who has been, uh, as you say, a, a seasoned activist at the age of 16, and who has been doing this work for a really long time, for those people who are just beginning to do the work, have only been doing the work for 10 or 12 years, but there's a lot of years left to go. How do you, what practices do you instill? How do you get the resilience that can carry you through what is lifelong work for environmental justice, for racial justice, for all these different things? So this is the wisdom of age, is understanding your seasons. I thank God that I am not that that I am not Brendolyn 50 years ago in this season. I, I'm I'm understanding that in this season my role is somewhat different. And to be able to refresh and restore and renew oneself, whether it's through reading or your gardening or your workout or your yoga in healthy ways. Um, tired soldiers on the battlefield gets everybody killed. Broke down foggy mind soldiers causes damage and you can't think clear. You can't fight hard. And so sometimes you got to fall back. It, it's okay not to be on the front line all the time. You have to fall back. And, and, and then falling back, humble yourself enough to push someone else forward and support them um, fully. And, and again, that's checking egos. I don't have to be the president of anything to be committed to the work that I do. My name never has to be called to do the work that I do. And so that kind of resilience when it's not a competition and it's not comparative, because that kind of stuff will wear you out. And just knowing that you are enough You've been equipped to do what you, in, in your lane, you are, and I get people tell me all the time, run for office, you should run. That's not my lane. I'm not a politician, I'm political, but I'm not a politician. And so to just understand your lane and work your lane, work, work your lane. That's your lane, work your lane. That's good advice. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is the last question that I like to ask everybody who has come on, which is, what are you missing the most in a COVID-19 world? And what is giving you hope that's sustaining you through this process? So what I'm missing most is also in, in 
COVID has given me time to reflect what I'm missing most. And it's in, not in a, in a good way. What I'm missing most is the fact that I was running all over hither, thither, and yon to do the work and um, understanding that I, I don't have to be uh, in Atlanta with you doing this interview, um, that we can touch the world in a new way. What I'm missing most, though, is um, 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 really my, 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 my babies um, in my congregation, their, their hugs and their delight in seeing me and, and those, the, 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 the the candy that I send them home with so they're on sugar highs with their parents and me. And, and that, I miss that. I miss my, um, the interaction, the physical hugs of my, and handshakes with my elder. I miss that. Um, um, what I'm valuing the most um, is that um, in addition to working, is that I've been, been able to almost birth this rest this in me that keeps trying to come out. I've, I've, I've not only gardened, but I've, 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 I've cooked some of the best gourmet meals ever. Um, my husband is hostage at the dining room table is my one man taste tester. <laughs> and um, that's been delightful just to sit back and have some time. The time to reflect and time to renew. It's been good, good for me. Sure in as much as the sadness of seeing um, as a former funeral director and forensics person and, and as a pastor, seeing the impact and what's going to be the post-trauma of how we are grieving and as a culture of people, especially the black community, culturally how we grieve and mourn and funeralize and that, that latent guilt of dropping someone in an emergency room and never seeing them again. That 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 I think is 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 um, one of the things that that is is causing me great concern and great consternation and great sadness um, because of some of the work that I do. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming here and for giving us some time and for all the work that you're doing and your partnership. Uh, I wanted to close us in the spirit of rest and resilience. I wanted to read this excerpt. Um, this is uh, Joe Harjo's poem, Praise the Rain. It says, praise the rain, the seagull dive, the curl of plant, the raven talk. Praise the hurt, the house slack, the stand of trees, the dignity. Praise the dark, the moon cradle, the sky fall, the bear sleep. Praise the mist, the warrior name, the earth eclipse, the fired leap. Praise the backwards, upward sky, the baby cry, the spirit food. Praise canoe, the fish rush, the hole for frog, the upside down. Praise the day, the cloud cup, the mind flat. Forget it all. Praise crazy, praise sad, praise the path on which we're led, praise the roads on earth and water, praise the eater and the eaten, praise beginnings, praise the end, praise the song and praise the singer, praise the rain, it brings more rain, praise the rain, it brings more rain. Thank you again so much. Um, everyone, please join us again next week, the same time, same place for our next episode of Coffee and Something Stronger. We'll be talking with uh, Reverend Dr. Beth Corey of the Candler School of Theology, who is a professor in the practice of youth education and peace building. And we're going to talk about how those intersect with environmental justice and what's going on in the world. So thank you so much. We'll see you next week. Thank you so much, Reverend Bozeman. Thank you.